PXG has done it again with the launch of a new lineup of drivers, fairways, hybrids, and irons. The new Gen 5 golf clubs deliver significantly increased MOI, faster ball speeds, longer distances, and tighter dispersions, all coupled with the exceptional feel and sound golfers have come to expect from PXG. Schedule your custom fitting or buy online at pxg.com. And we're back, Stripe Show podcast, on a Thursday. I'm your host, Travis Fulton. Thank you for making us part of your day. It is Thursday. You know what that means. We are going to go deep on some instruction. And I've got a special one that we've been working on for a while here on the uh, evolution of Max Homa's game. And, of course, I've been talking about it on the podcast for the last couple years and just how really all parts of his game is getting better. I mean, he's longer off the tee. He's more accurate with his irons. His short game is improved. His putting has improved. And uh, all of that uh, has a lot to do with the work that he's been doing with the guy joining me back on the podcast. I appreciate the time because I know he's one of the busiest in the business, Mark Blackburn. Thank you, sir. How are you? I'm great. Great to be on with you. Uh, excited to chat all things Max Homer. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's interesting. Like, You've been in this business a long time. I've been in this business a long time. It's fascinating to me just to talk. I like talking with coaches about the journey, the process, um, because that's so much of what it is. And, you know, Mark, sometimes you get with a student, and for whatever reason, it's like, man, we just don't gel. Things don't work. And then sometimes you get with a student, and it's like, damn, this is all good. I mean, we're just flying, right? I mean, everything's working. We communicate well. Uh, you know, he's getting the right info as as you see it. He's implementing it. He's going out and executing it. He's winning, you know, and it's that's what it feels like with you and, and Max, man. It just feels like this is a great team. Did you kind of get that sense right out of the gate? Uh, yeah, and I, I think you've hit on something there. Very important to stress is we have an awesome team. So Joe Griner, who's Max's caddy and longtime friend, they're, you know, best friends. I think he's obviously instrumental in all of this. We worked together with Kevin Chappell and obviously had a lot of success there. And when Max was struggling in 2020, he suggested or asked me if I would see him at Wingfoot. Um, we were both there for a titleist shoot. So I would say, first off, Joe gets a lot of credit because without Joe suggesting it and kind of being the matchmaker, it doesn't happen, right? So for from a coaching perspective, that's huge because when the caddy is on board with you, that's probably the most significant thing because between the coach and the caddy, that's a huge relationship and there's a lot of trust there. So a caddy to sort of entrust you because you, their livelihood is very much influenced by what you do. I think that's really, really important. Now, mm -hmm. beyond that, we also added last year, Phil Kenyon um, and, I think Phil has been huge to to Max, just the way Max's brain works. So you kind of alluded to like the relationships with player and coaches. And I would say it's all about the connection. I've worked with lots of different players that are really, really talented and there hasn't quite been the same connection. And I think with Max, the way he processes information, he likes to have answers. I tend to be very pragmatic and be like, look, here's what you're doing. Here's why you're doing it. Here's what you need to do to sort of implement a if you like remedy to your issue mm -hmm. and phil kenyon is very much the same as max says well phil's the putting version of you so it's kind of like this really really cool if you like group of coaches that work together and then he's got some great trainers great physical people he's got edward bolt working on his body and he's got colby wayne training him and then obviously his wife lacy is a huge part of it and then you've got matt broom and thomas parker so those, that's kind of like Max Homer, if you like, the team. And I would say I wouldn't be able to do what I do without those folks. And so it's not a huge team. There's lots of, you know, players who have a really big team. And I'd say we're kind of small and kind of mum and pop style, style shop. But I think that works really well for Max. But it's one of the things where when we first got together, he had lots of questions. And I always say students who have great questions, who are part of the, if you like, problem solving, that becomes really important and that leads to a lot of success because that 
their inquisitive minds, if you can quiet the mind, right, it's like a hamster wheel goes round and round and round. If you can provide answers and clarity, Mm -hmm. That tends to calm them down and then allows them to focus on what they need to do. If they hit a bad shot and they're on the golf course, you want to be able to give them, you know, the ability to error detect and, and understand, OK, this is what's happened. This is what's gone wrong. I've got the solution for it. You're kind of giving him the tools to be successful. And I would say he is one of the players who I've you know worked with now for a couple of years He's definitely on boards that really, really well. And that works well for him. Now, there's some players that things don't work well for, right? And it's all about reading the player, figuring mm -hmm. out when to say the right thing. And it's difficult because players tell you how this is how they like it. And then sometimes you like you read the situation. And as a coach, I think one of the intangibles you have is to be able to read the people and the situation. And sometimes your gut goes completely against what they tell you. And that becomes challenging. But with Max, it's kind of one of those things where you're trying to nurture the player. He's obviously super successful. He lost his game for a while. Heck of a player. Like, he was an amazing player before I ever met him, right? All I've done is given him a bit of direction and a bit of structure. So he's the one who's done all the work. But again, I would say largely he surrounded himself with a really good team and he trusts the team he has, which is, is massive. It's more a question of, okay, guys, what do we think? What do we need to do? And then he he trusts us to go on with that and do it and develop a plan. And so Joe, Phil, uh, hugely instrumental to the success. So uh, lots of people, you know, I get these mentions on telecasts and it's all me. Well, it's not, it's not just me. And I'd say my team here at Greystone have been really helpful too. Lane Savoy um, does a great job with the short game. He has a research project called Wedgecraft with Dr. Rob Neal and they've got the best sort of 25 short game players probably over the last 30 years and they've got 3D data and a really, really nice database um, of information. And I think that's also been very, very helpful, you know, especially to, to Max. So I've got a lot of resources here. My team, Brian, Max, Lane, Chip, Liz, um, I'm Max. I'm really lucky. I have a great team as well. So this is not a, I always say it takes a village. That's a long answer to the first question, but I would be <laughs> remiss if I didn't credit everybody else in there. And I think, you know, when you're leading a group of people on a team and you're you're trying to bring everybody along, and I think as a coach, you acknowledge, hey, here's my skills, here's my strengths. There are other areas that other people are going to be better at. And quite frankly, that's why I wanted him to work with Phil because just the way Phil interacts with players. And obviously Max went from, being a pretty good putter to being a, an excellent putter last year. So we have a great team. I'm really excited about 2023. And I think that, you know, our goal is to get Max to be the number one player in the world. Uh, I definitely think that we have a lot of momentum heading that way. So I'm excited for him. Yeah, his putting 2020 strokes gain 118th uh, limited sample here this season. He's 23rd. Last year he was 27th. Those are those are big jumps now. We'll get into the let's get into the swing here, and you've you've provided um, some swings, and this is this is 2020 yeah, uh, at the U.S. Open. Right after he missed the cut, he had one win one. up to this. Yep, that is uh, that's day one. So day one, okay. Uh, pretty, I just thought you asked for some swings, and I'm like, yeah. well, let's go day one, and then we've got some that are from, I guess this year at the tour championship. And then there's a couple um, just post president's cup. So the, the first thing is, you know, some people kind of are, I guess, skeptical of this, but the first thing I did with Max is I said, well, Max, I'll meet you in the gym at the Westchester Marriott downstairs. After I finished working out, commissioner Monaghan was riding his Peloton and Max was met me down there. And uh, I took him through a, you know, physical assessment. So the, the reason I think, with a lot of the players I've worked with, I've had successes. I build everything around what they're bringing to me. Their body is essentially the ingredients to the recipe. And I'm looking at, okay, well, what do they do? How do they move? What's going to work best for them in terms of their preference on ball flight, trajectory, height, et cetera, curve. And so with Max, we, we kind of looked at his body and I can tell have a good idea what's going to be favorable for a player and what's going to be challenging. And so you, you can see here on this video, Max really struggled with flighting a distance wedge. Okay. So one of the things I think that's really important to understand 
is that controlling your loft on the golf club, your dynamic loft at impact is, you know, what allows you to flight the ball down. And so Max's golf swing, he was kind of, if you, if you get that down the line view again, he was very much trying to work on getting his arms up. You can see how vertical the arms kind of get and the shaft pitch is really steep. And then he kind of drop it under and then he'd obviously extend into the ball. So those, if you like, ingredients, there's a great benefit to having high hands, big arc, just like a Justin Thomas. If your body facilitates that, well, in Max's case, he has a really hard time getting his arms above his head, shoulder flexion, maintaining his golf posture. And so his mechanism when he to can I get the club planing from there is he starts to move his pelvis into the ball, the sort of early extension as everyone talks about. So in an effort to kind of remedy that, I was like, well, Max, I think that you need to probably address what you're doing with the planing mechanisms of the golf club, right? So when you plane the club, you've got your wrists and your hands, you've got your shoulders, and then you some people use their lower body. Well, in a perfect world, you would kind of want to be able to use your upper body and then your lower body kind of moves and sequences and starts a downstroke. Well, that's not possible for everybody, especially when you move outside your, what I would call range of motion. So for Max, I was like, listen, it's really evident that if you were to get your lead arm lower and flatten your arm plane, I have a pretty strong feeling you would be able to fire your pelvis, control your lower body. The shaft would shallow more without you having to feel like you push your pelvis into the ball and extend to drop the mass of the club behind you. The release pattern would be very different because if you look at the face on here, there's a lot of handle twist. He can't control the dynamic loft and he couldn't launch the ball low. So he had a really hard time flighting the ball. And you can see how, mm -hmm. how much crossover there is in the wrist there. Now, mm -hmm. for certain shots when you play golf, there's some advantages to that. But when you're trying to hit flighted distance wedges and you want to hit really precision irons and great distance control, trajectory control, that's probably not ideal. And one of the things I think most people forget is on the PGA Tour and at major championships, hole locations are such that you need to be able to control your distance within a yard or two, and you need to be able to obviously have the right descent angle into the ball, into the green, excuse me. All those things are really important. Your club delivery is going to control that. And so the best players tend to maintain their delivery very consistently through the bag, right, they, for their preferred shot, whether it's a draw or whether a fade. And so for Max, it was like, look, your body is – you're trying to do something that your body doesn't want to do. So first off, that's probably not going to be good. And when you add stress to that, the lights and the music are up in a tournament, you're going to get exposed. And so it also led to him being very inconsistent with the driver. So he mm -hmm. didn't drive the ball particularly well. And obviously now he's a pretty amazing driver of the golf ball. So I think what we've kind of tried to do essentially is is – Cliff notes, build a golf swing that matches his body, right? His physicality, kind of big word for matching your body to, to what you can, your golf swing to what your body can do. So I would say that any type of assessment golfers can get, and probably the worse golfer you are and the, the more out of shape you are, the more advantageous it would be for you to probably get some type of physical assessment just to have an idea of what you can do. Because most people think, oh, I need to swing like this and I need to do this. Not necessarily. Like, if in a perfect world, you probably wouldn't necessarily have everybody's arms slightly flatter because it, it might reduce their distance. But in Max's case, he's really long and lean. He's got long levers. He still has plenty of height. He's got plenty of speed. He can get it in the 180s. Um, ball speed, no problem. And he's got lots of precision. But it's not to say it works for everybody. Right. Golfer, a coach who's got a similar physical sort of, if you like, makeup would be Charlie Hoffman. Again, great ball mm -hmm. striker, tends to have a flatter arm play. That's based around his, you know, body swing connection. That's not a preference. Like Charlie did that before I ever worked with him, but he figured out that that's, you know, what, what you probably need to do. So I encourage everybody to get like some type of assessment. And if you build your body, your golf swing around what your body can do, you're going to have better outcomes. So you get all these buzzwords about matchups. I've been teaching like this basically since about 2000 and probably more or less 2006. So with Heath Slocum, Robert Carlson. So I've been doing it a long time. Thanks to folks like 
Greg Rose and Dave Phillips at TPI and a lot of other really smart PT, Cairo type people, body guys. Haymaker Coffee Company was established in 2021 to create the best coffee to fuel the underdogs who perseveres, who hustles, and have the give it all mentality to achieve their American dream. Haymaker Coffee only roast top quality, specialty grade coffee beans resulting in brews that satisfies those who demand every drop from their coffee and day. If you work hard, run hard, fight hard, and play hard, we have your coffee right here. That's what we've done with Max. So really, he's being successful because he's swinging in a manner that matches his body. And now he can kind of go all in it. And a lot of the complaints he had that he would have in his goal swing went away when he wasn't fighting himself. And so obviously Mm -hmm. now he's a phenomenal wedge player. This is Eastlake this year. So you can see how the club comes a little bit straighter back. The arm planes lower. And we've, I would say that there's been a bit of a genesis of, of his swing. Lots of people might say that the pattern he had this year at um, the US Open at the country club, there's a lot of swings online. Yeah, it was fantastic and he was swinging well, but he doesn't, and it looks really, really pretty, right? But he didn't quite have the same face control. We went in the playoffs through BMW and Memphis, struggling a little bit, and then we kind of went to, all right, Max, look, let's get you back to fading the ball because he predominantly fades the driver anyway. That's kind of how he's become a much better driver because he's able to stay more in his posture, delivers the club very consistently. Um, And we went back to a fade. And and that swing has maybe a fraction more upright, just a touch because the takeaway is a little bit more out. But essentially, it's the same delivery. The club works up and down the plane and he stays in his posture really, really well. So he also does some things like we've measured him a lot in 3D on force plates. He's got some like really cool little ingredients that you the naked eye doesn't see. What and I, you know, as players, they all do good things, but some players have these superpowers that are really cool. So when you look at Max face on, something to note is Max kind of ascends in the backswing a little bit. He goes up very fractionally. You'll see the tip of his hat. So his his mass is ascending. And that allows him to create a lot of vertical force and a lot of stability through the swing. And you marry that up with kind of how his arm plane is lower and his ability to get around the corner. He, he kind of has some sneaky power in there, but mm-hmm. also that allows him to be able to vary his trajectory with his irons tremendously. So mm-hmm. some things that some people might say, well, I can't believe you kind of stand up in your swing. Well, there's a lot of these old school, if you like, do's and don'ts and faux pas in the swing that the reality is when you start measuring people they're actually these superpower ingredients that lead to some really really quality things and max has some of those in his golf swing so it's it's pretty cool i think the other thing that i would say we've worked really hard on is is his tempo and his timing so for a lot of golfers if you if you have any of those uh, longer clubs i don't know if you have I think I may have sent you a six iron and a driver. But if you look at the sort of timing and tempo here, that's at real speed. But he's trying to really smooth out that transition so he's not pulling on the handle. So one of the things that he struggled with a little bit was he'd get very upper body dominant, like he applied a lot of force to the shaft with his lead arm and his lead side. And we've worked really hard to create structure in his golf swing by the trail arm, right? Sort of. I'm an old golf machine guy, but the magic of the right forearm, there's a lot of great things that happen when you get the trail arm structure. And for him, once we got that and got the club in the right spot, the arm folding, matching kind of what his arms can do, he's then worked really hard in the transition part so that he's not pulling on the handle and steepening the shaft out. So for him, he's kind of like taking that sucker up there and then he's just spinning Mm -hmm. Arms are very, very passive. It's almost floating or levitating like spaghetti arms. And that's worked really, really well. But you can see how he does it. That tempo there is like just it's a dream, right? Exquisite. <laughs> I always tell him, I kind of show, send him a lot of it. He's a big tiger guy, right? As we all are. But I send a lot of videos to him, a tiger. And I'm like, just look at this tempo. Look at the timing. And, and it's almost like he's trying to put a little bit of slack in it and then just let it go. And that's. Mm-hmm right here that swing personifies it but his takeaway we tend to find when he gets the club a little more outside the hands and the face a little squarer 
it folds beautifully and the club gets more on it what I would term on its side at the top and then from there it's just turn and burn and that and that seems to really make a big difference for him and allows him to you know predominantly hit a full right shot but he can definitely move the ball right to left just by moving the ball back changing his alignments a little bit so it's it's one of the things I always say look you can have this perfect golf swing, but if you don't have great tempo and timing, there's no glue to hold the mechanics together. And if you go over time, you can have a fast tempo like Ben Hogan or Nick Price, or you could have a slow tempo like Ernie Els or Fred Couples, but they cover up a lot of idiosyncrasies or a lot of pieces which could lead to errant shots, especially under pressure. So that's something we've really worked on, and he's done a great job on that. I think the other thing with that is it really helps distance control. And if you've heard Max hit a ball or you've seen him hit a ball, he hits it out the middle a lot. Like mm-hmm. when people play with him, they're like, man, he hits it solid. And I think some of that's just because of how well he times it up and he's got the club in a great spot. So all he has to do is just turn and burn. But he's worked really hard to invest in the process of that and what causes what and knowing his cues. And I think that's what has really allowed him to play some great golf and it's one of those things people say he hasn't played well in majors, but he hasn't actually played that many majors. So the, the fact of the matter is he's gaining experience. And I think as he continues to to get more reps, so to speak in those environments, I think he's, he's really going to start playing well. And obviously I'd like to think that the president's cup was kind of his coming out party, so to speak in terms of how well he putted, you know, under pressure, hit some quality golf shots. And I think those things, for a player are huge because they're imprinting great outcomes in your mind, which allows you, you know, to, to pull on those when you get in a situation, go, okay, I've kind of done that. I had all the lights and the cameras on me and I was able to perform in an Excel. And I think as a coach, those are the moments that are priceless for you to help the player develop, right. And, and learn from. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's so many things here, you know, like it's a, it's like a great story of power and accuracy coming together. Um, you know, you go back to, and I was looking at these videos that you provided me, um, and you can see, you know, like you go back to 2020, and, and those watching on video, you can see this. Those wa- listening on audio will are painting the picture for you, but, but Max would, you know, try to elevate his arm, as Mark was saying, his left arm upright. And, and the face, you know, was was a little bit open, you know, and he had to not only try to get his uh, overcome the left arm upright and, and his pelvis wanting to ride in, but also then he had to um, kind of overcome that face a little bit, too. And as you were saying, as we look at this 2020 video from face on, this is a wedge. You can see a fair amount of crossover there in the wrist. That's a lot. And for a tour player, but that's how gifted they are. They can overcome it to a large degree. Then you go to this 2022 video and all of a sudden that face you know right there is a little more toe down you're already seeing the left arm working a bit more around and just you know from that you start looking face on mark there's uh, correct me if i'm wrong there's there's definitely now a little more shaffling he's he's able to flight it um he's let's say per se sustaining some of these alignments right here through the strike like you can see that position in post impact um, if you were to go two years ago, there would definitely be more crossover there. And uh, that shaft lean and the body supporting that, flighting that down is a is a huge thing. Then we fast forward here, and I want to get your thoughts on this, um, to post-President's Cup. And now it's, uh, and I love what you said about this, this kind of little upward move. <laughs> I, j- I just sent a tweet on this yesterday from a guy that was in here and he was trying to stay down. He was trying to turn and stay down in flexion. And, you know, he's probably 62 years old. He's a really good player, too. But as he's gotten older, he's he's gotten shorter and shorter and shorter. So I was like, look, let's just, you know, let's kind of, let's feel like we extend. Let's elongate up a little bit, keeping your orientation. And things started to lengthen out. And he's like, you know, I feel like I'm standing up. But I look at myself and I'm not. Like, it's like, you know, my head's staying still pretty level you know so this kind of upward elongation i just love and i could i've always been able to see that in in max's swing with the driver and i would imagine that when you look at the accuracy and we look at this first move here now in 2022 the club had a little more out in front the the club faced more square 
Um, whoops, hit the wrong button. Hold on. Stand by. Let's see, there it is. So with the with the uh, club face a little more square, the club head a little more out, the left arm working more around. Now you add this this kind of this really cool upward elongation with it. It's like, man, we've gotten more accurate. We're more powerful. You look at the distance, 2020, 300, 2022, 312. That's significant. 2020, accuracy, fairways hit 58.44. This year, 66.07. You know, greens and regulation, which I know is kind of a, you know, however you want to look at it, 63.8. This year, 72.22. I mean, more accurate, longer. And it's a great story of these components as we kind of recap. It makes sense. Right. I mean, it makes sense why he's more accurate. It makes sense why he's he's longer. And and this is possible to get longer and more accurate at a player like Max Holman, certainly for um, you know, a mid handicap listening to this. Yeah, for sure. And remember, the thing that most people forget is we're taking it's been a two year journey for one of the most talented golfers of the best one percent of golfers on the planet. Right. That makes sense. Yeah, right. A lot of people forget that. These guys work really, really hard. He has a great team. He's working on it all the time. So it's not only as he worked on the mechanical side of it, he's obviously worked on the physical side, the mental side. So there's all these pieces going. And it takes it takes a lot longer than people realize a lot of times to to do these things. But you're, you know, it's slow, steady, sustained persistence. And it's one of those things where you just keep chipping away at it. It's a bit like the tortoise and the hare. But I would say one of the things I see, we, we teach complete beginners all the way to the best players in the world uh, are our academy here at Greystone in Birmingham. And I would tell you that the more often than not, our best results come when you match something to what someone can physically do. And a lot of times people aren't always receptive to that on the front end, but they tend to really embrace it once they actually start to have more positive outcomes. And I think for the average golfer, you've got to remember what you see stylistically with the best players in the world isn't necessarily what's going to be optimum for the middle-aged golfer whose body is atrophying, who's losing range of motion. There are some things that we've traditionally been told don't do that. They're faux pas, but actually you probably should do. You know, if you want to hit it further, golf's an easier game. Stand up, let you, you know, bend your arms, like lift your foot. All these things that create more leverage, more range of motion. Now, you want to be careful that you don't get injured doing that. Because obviously you're, you're moving stuff and you're going to generate more force. But those are all things that are mechanisms that stylistically may look very different to a 2000 Tiger Woods who's extremely supple. But at a closer look, take a look at Carl Berkshire or Longer Driver or what Bryson's done. And all of a sudden you're going to see some of those ingredients in those players. It's like if you want to hit it further, it's, it's pretty simple. If you want to hit mm -hmm. it straighter, the ingredients to that are a little bit different. If you want to <laughs> great wedge shots. The best wedge players out of the Wedgecraft Research Project don't slide down the target. They rotate. They lean the shaft so they can have low launch and high spin. Like there's certain ingredients that to create ball behavior you need to have. Mm -hmm. And the hard part about golf is the ball behavior that you get from a you know 160 foot three iron going into a front pin at Oakmont is a completely different ball behavior that you need for a low flighted wedge, you know, that's going to one stop and grab and it's going to spin a lot and launch it, you know, let's say 27 degrees. But the golfer has to be able to do all that. So the average golfer needs to figure out what's easier for them out of all the shots where they can, where can they do it a lot and build their game around that. And I think a lot of times people forget that, like you don't have to be great at all of it, but you, if you're pretty good at, some of it, you can be yeah. good a, a good player. And club golfers have so many shots in their sort of dispersion of from between 150 yards and in that if they just practice their short clubs, their chipping and pitching, they probably score way better. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think the last thing I'll say to this is, and this is something that we kick around a lot here on the podcast, is so often at this level, and I think even in amateur golf, like the development of the backswing and what the value that that has to improve the probability of impact and do what you want to do at impact is significant. And this whole adage of just, you know, it's all about impact, right? Just get to that. Get, like, from a development standpoint, it's not that easy. I mean, it's, it's there's got to be some things happening before it 
that kind of lead to it, right? And and so, in my experience and talking with you and just in, in in my years of teaching, is developing that backswing. Uh, not always, right? I mean, not you're not gonna. It's not you can't say this is for everyone, but to I would say a majority in a large portion, man, you get the club playing pretty good in the left arm in a decent position and and some wrist structure and face angle, like we got pretty good chance. <laughs> we got a pretty good chance, especially, especially with a player like Max. I, so my last question to you is as this all this has developed, right? And and then and then you talked about smoothing it out. Just let it be. Don't pull, just let it be and just turn and hit it. Did you do you find that like just the downswing and the exit plane and all these things just kind of kind of got better without talking about it because of the work you put in leading up to it. Yeah, sure. So I tell players, like, if anyone's worked with me, they'll kind of hear this. I'm trying to stack the deck in your favor. So <laughs> if you think about right. when the club is moving the slowest, it's the easiest to make adjustments. Now, some people don't agree with me, but so the, when the club's not moving at all, in my opinion, easiest. So set up adjustments. The grip is a little contentious depending on the player. Mm -hmm. If the player's not very good, I will change a grip in a heartbeat because they're not good enough for it to matter anyway. But so set up posture alignment grip. So number one, like that's you, you, that's the least invasive. The club's moving the slowest. Right. So now the takeaway, like where's the club relative, you know, the club moving, the sweet spot, the center of mass, starting to move slowly. Okay, when it pitches up, if, you, you know, lead arm parallel to the ground or P2, where's the club pitching? Where's the mass? What's the shaft doing? Okay, what's the body doing here? And then when you get to the top, you know, get to P3, P4, okay, what's the structure at the top? What's the relationship between the club center of mass and the sweet spot and the arms? Where is the player likely to, you know, move from that position? And so if you, and it's not really a position because the club's always moving, right? But if you stack it in their favor, mm -hmm. odds are when the club's in a pretty good spot, most people will have pretty good sequence as in, pelvis first torso lead arm club it's really interesting when you put people in 3d you do one hand and you get them in the right spot left or right mm -hmm. they seem to just turn and burn and go and so i would certainly say a lot of the things that you're trying to accomplish at impact organically develop prior right so everything in golf is a delay and so force precedes motion you have to apply a force somewhere to create a motion there's this big arrears of how long does it take for something to happen. So what mm -hmm. you start with at address can drastically affect what you do later in the swing. And so I'm always, you know, I'm trying to get club delivery. Obviously, we're validating that with track man, ball flight, all these other things. But I'm trying to influence that in the least invasive way before it ever happens. Because from down, I call it downswing blackout from the top of the backswing to impact. I don't know many people who can do anything. Now, Jack Nicholas no. may have tweaked it to hit that one iron at Pebble Beach, and people talk about that, but you, I don't think you consistently do that over 18, 36, no. 54, 72 holes, and then in a, you know, let's say a 18 to 20 tournament season. You just can't do it, right? No. So I'm trying to influence that, to your point, before it ever happens, and I encourage everybody to kind of think that way because what you do early – set you up for success later in the swing. That's that's well said. I I love it. And um that's why I love talking to you guys about, you know, just <clears throat> I and that's what I hear more times than not. Now I know there's there's some different opinions and there always is, <clears throat> but I tend to agree um with that wholeheartedly. And it's just fun to watch how the chain coming down gets better and better. And it's like, oh wow, look at that. Now the club's on my right form and I've actually got some shaft lean in and my body's turning better and my weight's over there. And it's like all these things are starting to like stack up and they're, and, and, and like, we haven't even talked about it because of the, the work that we've put in ahead of it. So Mark, this is good stuff, man. I, um, I, I know my audience enjoyed this because I, you know, I know it's Max home and I know he's one of the best players in the world, but at the same time, these changes, I think are a conversation that we would have from time to time, even with an amateur golfer in lead arm depth club face angle shaft pitch right now are we able to do it at the at the level of skills max of course not but i think it all i think in in max's case it's very um relatable 
right, in this conversation and, and how it can apply to so many that are listening. So I can't thank you enough, man. I, I'll tell you what, I'd love to um, I'd love to get your team on and dive into this wedge stuff and have yeah. them, and have them sh talk about wedge game just specifically and what is happening there with your guys' database. I think that'd be really cool. Yeah, no, definitely. Let's, uh, Lane and Rob have done a fantastic job with their Wedgecraft project, so uh, you definitely need to have them on. Happy to to be part of it too, but those guys do a, do a great, great job, and yeah. there's some fascinating information in there. So when you know what the best players do and you can objectively look at it, it's really interesting because we tested some players who will say they feel one thing, but they're doing something completely different, and therein lies the uh, difficulty of golf. A lot of times what we feel as players isn't what we're actually doing, but we try and communicate our subjective feels and right. that leads to a lot of golfers demise. But yeah, it's definitely a fascinating study and uh, love to get those guys on with you for sure. All right. Good stuff. Mark Blackburn, one of the best. Appreciate your time, buddy. You got it. You'll take care. Thanks. Bye. Haymaker Coffee Company was established in 2021 to create the best coffee to fuel the underdogs who perseveres, who hustles and have the give-it-all mentality to achieve their American dream. Haymaker Coffee, only roast, top quality, specialty-grade coffee beans resulting in brews that satisfies those who demand every drop from their coffee and day. If you work hard, run hard, fight hard, and play hard, we have your coffee right here.